Okay, microphone level set. Randall Rouser set. Uh, unmuting Camille set. Hey Camille, you're live. Hi, how is it going? Good. I I really like the shirt you're wearing, but they can't see you. Uh, let me, uh, you know, let me present you. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just oh, okay. Let me uh, get you. I forget. Oh, there you are. Let's make you big. I really like the shirt you're wearing. Yeah, it's it's a great conversation starter. You know, like people Le lean always forward ask and, me. and straighten it out. Uh, yeah. By the way, Christianity <laughs> is true. People always ask me if I'm a Christian, and I can always explain that uh, you know I'm just wearing it, wearing it ironically, and that makes for a great conversation uh, about religion. No, but the the reason why I bought it is because I always put my money where my mouth is, and when I say that I support uh, Christian apologetics, I'm not kidding. <laughs> there you go. You spent real money, real uh, Eastern European euros to buy that. How much did it cost? Uh, I don't know. I, I tried to buy that for you as well and send it to your address, but for some reason I couldn't buy it and send it to someone else. Um, yeah, so because otherwise we would make a, a nice pair, you know. Oh, thank you for the donation, Tony. I got a, I got like four monitors up right now. Uh, Dustin, oh, who was here first? Dustin two five three six nine. You were here first. Congratulations. Are you the Dustin that I typically see? But you're, you're. Your name looks a little different. Hey, Joe. Hey, Humble Thinker. You're in third place today. Okay, so um, I'm not going to be focusing on the chat too much. Um, so this is Randall Rouser. Uh, do you remember I did a video with him a, a while back? Oh, I do. That's my favorite video. <laughs> uh, I did two of them, I think, with him. And oh, this, the second one, of course. Yeah, the second one where um, I let him interview me on my channel. And um, I forced him to ask me questions uh, in try to get him to do follow-up questions and it was a disaster it was just a um, train wreck but it was kind of fun in, in the same sense too but um let's see randall rouser is a guy on twitter he's uh he has i'll put uh, links to his twitter and his uh i'll try to help uh, support him as well links to his blog uh in some aspects he's uh he seems to come across as this i don't know if progressive is the right word but more sympathetic to non-christians point of view he seems to, I think, shun all the bad stuff in the Old Testament. He doesn't. I don't think Randall Rouser believes that Jesus commanded the killing of the Amalekites and the Canaanites and that sort of thing. I think he rejects all that. But I think he accepts most of the claims in the New Testament as being historical. And when he defends that, which he did on my channel, and he does, he will do in this video. He sounds just like Jay Warner Wallace, in my opinion. He sounds just like Gary Habermas, in my opinion. He sounds like a um, old fart uh, conservative fundamentalist apologist who should be 100 pounds overweight, sweating from the sides of his head in front of a congregation saying, this is true. And um, <laughs> is that too much, Camille? <laughs> no, he was definitely channeling some Lee Strobel, you know. Oh. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> there's so many thoughts going. I'm going to save the drink for later. Okay, here we go. Uh, and he says some interesting things about faith as well. Signs. The penultimate sign or the second. So I have the. Uh, Camille can't hear this, but uh, I have the closed captioning up so he can watch it. Greatest sign is the resurrection of Lazarus or the revivification of Lazarus where he comes back to life. But the final ultimate sign in John is the resurrection of Jesus himself. And I want to take a look at uh, that miracle today. So I want to start off by talking about this the is fact important. that there are two ways, generally speaking, that you can believe in the resurrected Jesus or that you can believe in this specific miracle. The first way that you can believe in the resurrection of Jesus is uh, by way of faith. Okay, th this is just fascinating to me because how many times have you heard Christians say that faith is not a blind faith. Faith is is uh, based on evidence, and it is trust, uh, confidence in in something. But it's not it's not based. The trust is based on something. There's meat there, and 
what Randall Rouser is doing here is he's saying there's two ways to believe in the resurrected Jesus. And first is faith, which he defines as trust. And the, the second way is through the historical method, the historical evidence, which he's about to talk about later. But you can't have trust in Jesus without the historical stuff, can you? I mean, we're, how do you even know about Jesus if it wasn't for the traditions and the texts, the Holy Scriptures? How would you even know about the Holy Spirit? How would you know, even know any of this stuff happened if it wasn't passed down either traditionally or through the, the text? You wouldn't. I, this, is, um, I wanna say, uh, th this is an amazing thing that, uh, what's his name, uh, Ricky Gervais said. If you could do a mind wipe on Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Christianity, a mind wipe on every person on the planet, get rid of all the texts about Christianity on the planet, and then just wait uh, a few decades. Would Christianity come back, assuming Jesus never returned? No. That'd be it. That'd be the end of Christianity. It would not come back. There's not like, oh, I'm having this, this burning in my bosom. Uh, Jesus is real. Oh, Jesus who? Who are you talking about? Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit is protecting me in my life. The Holy Spirit? What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be great if we like found out some tribe in Amazon that hadn't had a contact with West, like civilization, and when we talked to them for the first time, they said, yeah, 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 you know, we believe in like one triune God, and there are three divine beings that are emanating from the same uh, essence, you know, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, that would. But we don't have that. <laughs> that would be pretty interesting evidence if. Uh... But then you would have to, okay, did the Christianity seep into that tribe somehow? And then we just don't, not aware of it. But yeah, it's this whole idea that whenever a Christian says faith is a separate way from, and I'm not sure if Randall's actually saying this, but it sure looks like it when he says two ways to believe. These, these ways are basically one way. And I think the, the Calvinist types who will say sola scriptura, they understand exactly what I'm saying here. And they're probably shitting on their head. Yeah, you can't base this on your own personal experience because guess what? I have a billion reasons for you to doubt your personal experiences. And they're called non-Christians, at least a billion who have had personal experiences. Billions and billions of reasons why you should doubt and even you should, your anxiety should go up that every experience you've had of Jesus is probably wrong. Whoa, I'm, on, I'm in a little... I should slow down a little bit. <laughs> and faith in its essence is trust. So you can have faith or you can trust in uh, the life of Jesus as you've experienced it in your own life, as he has revealed himself to you. And you can know that he has risen through your own story, the way that he has acted and worked in your life. You can know Jesus has risen by your own story. If you were completely ignorant of the scriptures and of the traditions, you would know there was a man named Jesus who rose from the dead just from going to Walmart and having your own personal experiences or sitting in a room and meditating? I don't think so. Yeah, interestingly enough, he later brings up uh, Mormon missionaries who tried to convert him. And they basically said that, yeah, they have this burning in the bosom. And that verifies a bunch of historical claims, like, you know, Joseph Smith receiving revelation from the angel Moroni and stuff like that. So yeah, it's we'll, really we'll get weird. There. I can... Uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's like five minutes, no, less than five minutes apart, these two two ideas, right? Hey, Topher M, thank you for your tithe. Uh, yeah, this is where you pay your tithe. And Scott Duke, thank you for your tithe. Uh, well, I shouldn't say tithe because uh, that means you guys don't make a whole lot of money. I've watched hours of your videos. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Scott. Uh, you can have faith through the word preached in the church from great pastors like Pastor Tyler. And there are many other ways that faith can manifest itself in your life. However, sometimes you run into an obstacle when it comes to faith, that you have the problem that people have uh, skepticism, right? That they haven't had the same faith experiences that you've had. Let me give you an illustration because it might be easier to see it in another religious tradition. And actually, I preached last year at, at Greenfield on uh, Doubting Thomas, which, of course, Tyler just preached on as well recently. And I use this illustration that I'd like to talk about here. So uh, you can see here that there are these two young gentlemen who are two Mormon missionaries. And... I met a couple of Mormon missionaries like these guys a few years ago, and they wanted me to become a Mormon, right? That's what Mormon missionaries do. They try to convert you to Mormonism. And I expressed my skepticism. I explained why I couldn't become a Mormon. Now, what they wanted me to do was simply to pray and ask uh, God to reveal the truth of Mormonism to me so that I could have a burning in the chest and I would know that it was true and I could have faith in the truth of Mormonism. Sort of sounds like the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit to me. 
And it sounds like their experiences uh, led them to the truth without using any historical method. The problem, of course, from my perspective, is that I raised some evidential objections to Mormonism. I pointed out some of the claims that Mormons make that I believe to be false. And I said, you know, I can't really... And this is exactly what many non-Christians do to Christians. Consider yeah, and, and by the way, this is, this is like when we say that... Uh, uh, that Christian apologetics is counterproductive. This is what we are talking about, right? Because imagine you are just a normal Christian who doesn't really think about this stuff, but you just know that Jesus died for your sins because of your uh, personal experiences and because you have like a personal relationship with him. And you, this is like one thing that you are the most confident about, like all of all the things in your life. And here is a Christian apologist who explains to you how this is not a good reason essentially for uh, being a Christian because there's a bunch of other religions that justify competing claims exactly the same way right. like uh, imagine hearing that as a normal Christian how does that not just so to totally yeah. shake your boat right and what does he go on to replace this with like he wants you a normal Christian to replace your personal relationship with Jesus with a bunch of historical claims and like historical arguments with a lot of maybes and probably and perhaps yeah. it's just like lowering the he he is the, doing our work for us you know ah yeah uh, these are phrases i think uh, need to be spread um the the pine creek gospel there are billions and billions of reasons for you to doubt your personal attribution of a spiritual experience billions of reasons for for you to doubt that and and they're called every other religion other than christianity and um, yeah, so in, the, in this whole burning in the bosom, it, this, with the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit, it has to be linked, it has to be chained to something more solid in order for you to even say, that, oh, this is God doing it, not Satan. How do you tell the difference? Well, you got to have, it has to be into the historical method um, or the traditions. The truth of Mormonism, and I can't just look for a spiritual experience until you can address some of these concerns and objections that I have. And I think that this is a problem that we sometimes run into as well, that sometimes non-Christians, people from outside of our community of faith, people who haven't had our experience of the risen Jesus, they might similarly raise skeptical objections. They say, well, uh, that's good for you, but how can I know that Jesus rose from the dead if I haven't had your experience? It, uh, Randall, you don't know Jesus rose from the dead from a personal experience. You do not. You, how? How? You actually had a vision of Jesus rise from the dead and you trusted that as uh, this is true? If that's the case, shame on you. Yeah, I would like to, I would like him to take a piece of paper, or write down all the historical claims about what happened in the past that he knows from his uh, from his personal experience, right? So the the claim that Jesus rose from the dead would be on the list. Would, for example, the traditional authorship of the Gospels be also on the list, or is that something that that he, he doesn't know from personal experience, you know? Yeah. Uh, because I'm a historian. I want to know what happened in the past. I'm studying to be one anyway. Uh, so if this is like a, a legitimate method, I want to know what all I learn about the past using that method. Like what, what's on that laundry list, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. Make a list of all the things you know from personal experience, from spiritual experiences, and then make another list of what you know from the historical method or from the texts or traditions, yeah. and compare and, the two. And, and specifically about things that happened 2,000 years ago, you know? Yeah, this is... Um, hey, th thank you for the donation. Uh, was it Joshua White? Uh, I appreciate it. Now... The Mormons, when I talked to them, they had no response. They couldn't respond to my objections. But I don't think Christians are in this. I know exactly how you feel, Randall, when I talk to Christians. Same situation. I think that, in fact, when we encounter skeptical objections from people, that we have many good things that we can say in reply. And so I want to say the second way that you can know about the resurrection of Jesus is through the evidence. In fact, through historical evidence of the way that Jesus uh, has been. Can remember, this is the second way, a unique and distinct way of coming to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Number one, faith, which is separate than number two, evidence. Now, I'm sure he's going to say, well, they're, yes, Doug, they're interrelated. Yeah, they are interrelated a lot. Been revealed in history. And I want to take a look at that today. And I first of all, want to emphasize why this matters as a question. Why does it matter that there is evidence to support our claims in the resurrection of Jesus? Why does it matter that it's not only a, a matter of, of our subjective experience of Jesus, but also... You notice he said only there? I don't know if uh, Camille can't hear it, but he... he yeah, he kind of corrected himself. It's not only a, a matter of, of our subjective experience of Jesus. Not only. It's like that number one, that faith is... 
not only that, it's, I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading something into this, but it almost sounds like that faith part is not as strong as the, maybe the second part. Just, but also a matter of objective historical evidence. Well, the reason is because Christianity is a historical faith. Christianity is very different from a religion like Buddhism. At the heart of Buddhism is... We don't need to know about Buddhism. There were <laughs> yeah, I would probably would skip that. And if you just follow those teachings, the interest really... The Buddha taught Christianity, however, is very different. Christianity is based okay, upon... Yeah, yeah. Christian, so he talks about Buddhism, but Christianity is very different. Randall, every religion, every adherent to a religion thinks their religion is special and unique, which in some case it is. It is true that... A claim. A claim that God acted in history to raise Jesus from the dead after he was crucified. And that that miracle is the foundation on which Christian proclamation rests. This is the way that Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching... Okay, so yeah, this, this is the linchpin. Here. If we are wrong, yeah, I Jesus agree. Not been raised, First Corinthians 15 first of all, is my favorite passage in the Bible. So what I want to do is I want to look at the evidence for the historical resurrection of Jesus. And our um, historical documents that we'll be looking at come from the Bible. Now, again, skeptics at this point often say something like this. Well, skeptics is a uh, code for atheist, I think, for most Christian apologists, even though Christians are skeptics themselves. Uh, he was he was a member. He Randall called himself a skeptic towards uh, Mormonism earlier. The Bible, that's just a single source, right? That, uh, you, I want you to give me several, several sources to give evidence for this resurrection of Jesus. But in fact, the Bible is a collection of sources. It's not a single source. It's a library. Here's a quick overview of some... It's a library of 66 books, not 10,000 like some other apologists, but it's 66. <laughs> some of the sources that we find in the Bible and in the New Testament, and in particular, sources that testify to Jesus. So first... How a story, the life of a person of a great person. Oh, okay. So, so first of all, those are often called by ancient historians Greco Roman biographies. Which, okay, Greco Roman biographies. This is one thing that, um, if you're a Christian, you might not have learned. <laughs> Greco, uh, <clears throat> maybe I'll form it in a, in a question to Camille. Camille, true or false? Greco Roman biographies sometimes make claims that are false. Yeah, true. True or false? Greco-Roman biographies sometimes contain myth. True, both in the modern sense and in the how it was understood back then. Okay, so true or false? The Gospels are often called by historians uh, a Greco-Roman genre. Biography. Yeah, this this is an angle that Christian apologists push, uh, but no, I. Not all, all New Testament scholars think that it's the same genre. Okay. I, I think the strongest case for Gospel of Luke, but I don't think Gospel of Mark is a Greco-Roman biography. Okay, but this is what I want to try to get through to the, some Christians listening. If you are going to say that the Gospels are ancient Greco-Roman biographies, please realize that you're shooting yourself in the foot if you're trying to bolster this as being historically accurate. Am I right or wrong here? Uh, yeah, good. Uh, another question. Is it true true or false? Uh, ancient authors of Greco-Roman biographies feel free to invent details to create a plausible narrative based on existing sources. For example, if, you, if they already knew from tradition that Jesus appeared to disciples, they felt free to create a scene and create details. For example, Jesus eating a piece of fish. Uh, the disciples touching his wounds and stuff like that. That's true. This was common and it wasn't considered deceptive and the audience understood that this is going on. Okay, when I had a discussion with Blake Giunta, I granted for the sake of argument that the Gospels are Greco-Roman biographies precisely because this is counterproductive for uh, an apologist. And in the conversation, he actually begged me not to grant that. He ended up saying, you know, you shouldn't be saying that these are Greco-Roman biographies. Yeah. Because I think he realized this is a problem. Yeah, so smart Christians, no, that's, I take that back. Educated Christians will kind of be cautious in calling the, or bragging about the Gospels being of that genre because they realize there's problems within that genre. And so maybe this is why Randall Rouser doesn't have a rational belief in Christianity because maybe he doesn't know this. I don't know. Um, maybe he's not. Uh, <laughs> that's going back to that other video. <clears throat> Cheap shot. Which means that they tell a story, the life of a person, of a great person, in this case, Jesus, and they tell it according to the standards of history writing in the ancient world that was known as Greco-Roman biography. 
So we actually have four different voices already testifying to Jesus. Yes, we have four different voices. <laughs> True or false, oh, we have Camille? Much, many, many more than that. We have many, many uh, other Gospels. They just didn't make it into the canon. <laughs> exactly. We have way more than four. True or false, the Gospels are independent of each other. Uh, that's debatable. I, I personally probably think that, uh, yeah, it's just uh, all depend. Uh, all ultimately boil down to Mark, at least the four that are in the canon. Yeah, because Mark is the first one. Okay, so he goes mm -hmm. on to talk about the sources, the M source, the L source, the Q source. But by the, by the way, we have none of this. We don't have this in our possession, just like we don't have the original of the Gospels in our possession. Yeah, I, th I think he only mentioned Q. But I, I would probably think that, yeah, even John was uh, aware of at least one of the synoptics, probably Luke, or the other way around. But the point is, these Gospels are at least in some way not they're dependent on each other at least a little bit. I think almost every historian would agree with that. Yeah, the, the, the point is that like, if you imagine, for example, the author of the Gospel of John writing the Gospel, whoever that might be, uh, he either had one of the other Gospels in front of him, or he at, he at least read it before he started writing. Right, okay, let's keep After going. After Mark. And Matthew and Luke are believed to have used Mark as a source because there's a lot of material in Mark that yes. also appears in Matthew and Luke. Okay, so there's shared material in Matthew and Luke, which is called Mark and material. There's also material in Matthew, which is unique to Matthew, and that's called M material. Yeah, this is where he gets into the different L, M, and source. Is, yeah, and well, L, maybe one, you, one important point to realize, which I think people don't bring up when they discuss independence of the sources. So let's say, uh, for the sake of argument, that all of the gosp four Gospels are mutually independent. It's not like, like it, th that doesn't really establish as much, because it's not like the only way how a gospel author in the first century would learn about Jesus being raised is by reading a different gospel, right? Like even if all four of them were independent, well, they would obviously still all got that from like prior tradition because they, the authors were Christian, you know? It's like if like four different Christians today tell you that Jesus was raised, well, it's not difficult to figure out where they got that from, you know? It's like four different newspapers reporting on uh, something that Trump said, for example. Uh, you don't have to imagine that like one newspaper got it from the other. They can just all point to the different source, to the same source. Yeah. And, but the same source can still be false, right? Because we're talking about Trump after all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, this is the challenge I've been giving out for years. Find in the library called the Bible, uh, someone who writes with their own hand, identifies themselves in the first person and says, I saw the risen Jesus. The answer is you only find one person, one place, that's in the letters of Paul, and even that is in a vision, unless you believe in the third coming of Jesus, because Jesus apparently already ascended, then came back to say hi to Paul, and then went back up into heaven, and is going to come back a third time. If you want to buy that, go ahead. But otherwise, it's a vision. And uh, and kudos to, I, I'm thinking of a, a sub named Franklin who said, well, Revelation 1 says, identifies the person as John who saw the risen Jesus. Um, but that's clearly another vision. Some people say it's it's in First or Second Peter, but that was a witness, and a lot of historians don't think Peter wrote those, at least not the second one. But even in that one, it says that Peter was a witness to the sufferings of Christ, not the resurrection. If you read it closely, it doesn't actually say that. So really, you're... Christians, if you want to, some Christians, if you want to understand why non Christians don't buy this eyewitness testimony thing, it's because of what I'm saying right now. When it's and also, if, yeah, if, if you want, uh, if you want an apostle of Jesus to write in his own name and tell you that he saw the risen Jesus, just pick up the secret book of James because that claims to be written by James and it talks about an appearance of Jesus to James. So, there you go. The problem is, it's not in the canon. Why wouldn't they add? That's great, luscious evidence. Why wouldn't they put that because in the canon? Because it's heretical. It's, it's agnostic. By the way, and it was written late. It, it's, it, it's, you know, a later forgery. So, I remember when I was a Christian, I often asked the question, why didn't Jesus write something and put it, you know, and eventually he knew it would go into the canon because he knows, I guess, some of the future at least. Well, don't you know he actually wrote stuff? But that's later forgery. Oh, okay. But there, there are actually writings in Jesus' name, at least one that I am aware of. 
Oh, Camille, uh, this is a good spot. This is a little bit of a side, but there'll be a, this will be interesting. Trust me, this will be interesting. Camille, why didn't there, why weren't there reports of Jesus healing the sick, doing miracles, preaching and teaching about a decade after his resurrection? Sorry, can you repeat that? Why isn't there any record of Jesus teaching, healing, preaching a decade after his resurrection? Healing, teaching, and preaching. Um, I, I don't know what you're getting at. What, why, why don't we have records of 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus that Jesus was at a certain city yeah. and healed people? Um, like, why isn't there a text that describes that that was written 10 years after the no, crucifixion? No, 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 no. No, no. Why isn't there a text saying that Jesus, 10 years after his resurrection or, so, or about, was actually oh, at a certain city oh, okay, okay, okay. And, and doing miracles? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm wondering what's the best explanation for that. I would say like a pretty good explanation is that he was still dead, uh, de decomposing in his tomb. But if you are a Christian, you have to come up with a different explanation. I think it's probably going to involve people going up above sea level. Yeah, let me... Know, let, increasing let, latitude. Yeah, let, let me... Uh keep this very simple for the people in Alabama listening. The reason why G it, there's no text talking about Jesus going into a certain city and healing people about a decade after his resurrection is because Christians believe he already ascended. Now, there's two explanations here. He, that's true, that he really did ascend. The another explanation is he never rose from the dead in the first place. That's why we have no record of him doing all these things. So the ascension... This, uh, this is Cam Spires, uh, full credit to Cam Spires on this one. The ascension in that way is just as important as the resurrection. Because if there is no ascension, odds are there's no resurrection. Now, how many sources do we have? This is getting back to Randall Rouser now. How many sources do we have for the ascension of Jesus? Yeah, it's it's narrated in Luke and Acts. Uh, you can make an argument for like it's being alluded to in I think in Matthew. Uh, but uh, it, that's a really interesting question. Like, does Paul, for example, ever reference the ascension? No. I don't think so. No, he doesn't. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Jason Church, for the large donation paying for my Pine Creek chemical fix. It's all natural. Yes, dopamine is the only drug I recommend, and I take it regularly. <laughs> regularly. <laughs> Uh, okay, back to Randall Rouser. But uh, for non-Christians listening, this is something that I, you got to do it a very special way, but set it up as, why don't we hear about Jesus doing healings about 10, 15, 20 years after his resurrection? Well, because he wasn't on planet Earth. So that ascension is really important. You need to... And, and Oh, but true or false, Camille, the ascension of Jesus is a minimal fact adopted by a consensus of scholars. <laughs> no. Uh, well, <laughs> neither is the resurrection, right? Oh, yes, that's true, too. Okay, back to Randall. Sorry, Randall, we're leaving you out. You have Q. That's five sources, not just four. So already, this is getting to be a more and more complex library. Now, in terms of dating, we could say a lot about how you date the Gospels. And frankly, the Gospels are not my primary focus this morning. But I do want to say this, that... Yeah, I don't know if we want to get into dating. He talks about how Mark is... Uh, no, um, Acts doesn't mention Paul's death, and therefore it has to be dated before Paul's death. And if Acts is dated before Paul's death, then that means Mark has to be dated, and maybe even Matthew has to be dated way before that. And so therefore, this is really early stuff. Here's what I have to say about that. Oh, actually, Camille, why don't you go first, and then I'll say something. Yeah, I I'm not actually sure if this is a majority view. It's definitely not an overwhelming consensus. Hopefully we are going to have some hard data from Mike Lacona soon because he has a student who's apparently going through all of the relevant literature and collecting like numbers of scholars who date uh, the Gospel of Mark uh, uh, differently. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not a minimal fact, like Gospels be, and, I, and as I said, you know, is this something that he knows from personal experience? Probably not. I want to make a couple points. Uh, one point is, uh, Randall Rouser, you sound like the fundamentalist conservative guy named J. Warner Wallace to a T here. And maybe maybe J. Warner Wallace is the source of your information. I don't know. If that's the case, maybe you don't have a rational Christianity. <laughs> and uh, if you want to be really insulting, he sounds exactly like Frank Turek in that last Scripture oh, Christianity yes. video. This, that's exactly the same thing. Does The, uh, the end, act ends uh, before... Um, Paul's martyrdom. 
Yeah. And, and, for, <laughs> and for the atheists out there who support guys like Randall Rouser, whenever you hear or see Randall Rouser from this date forward, think Jay Warner Wallace. <laughs> think Frank Turek when it comes to point number two here, the reason to believe in the resurrection, because he's saying he's regurgitating the exact same stuff. But back to the dating. For Christians, the dating is really, really important, even though guys like Frank Turek will say, well, well, no, I'll, I'll scratch that from the record. The, it, the dating is really important. Why? Because if it's dated, if the Gospels were written post the first century, let's say 101 AD, um, Anybody who could have written about it is dead, who saw it. They're dead. They're gone. So the dating is really important. Now, for the non-Christian's point of view, not just atheists, but non-Christians, the dating is actually irrelevant to us, I think, for most of us. I think if, if the resurrection of Jesus was written about five minutes after it happened, guys like myself will still not just believe it based on someone saying, oh, I saw a guy rise from the dead and it was written five minutes later. So whether it's five minutes or 50 years, this, it, the evidence does not match the claim. And if you think it does, my goodness, what are you forced to believe from this point forwards? You're going to have to believe so much garbage you don't want to believe. Camille, I heard you take a deep breath. If you want to say yeah, something. and it's actually interesting. We have uh, at least one uh, piece of literature from the ancient world where the author specifically says that it took for a supernatural claim like less than one day to develop so something happened like a, a guy burned himself and within the next day there already was a story about him like ascending to heaven from the funeral film from the pyre um, well, where was this what what's this uh yeah this is from Luke, this is in lucianos of samosat it's actually interesting like uh there was a there was a philosopher who like publicly burned himself to death uh in like a public square and Lucianos was lo looking at it, and he decided to start a rumor. So he, he like started talking to people in the crowd who saw it, s telling them that he saw the philosopher ascending to heaven. And later that day, he already met people who were circulating the story, and who even claimed that they saw that saw it wait, themselves. Wait, 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 Camille, are you saying that legends can develop after twenty four hours? Yeah, uh, I would just I would like when you're talking about this, you need to emphasize that uh, Lucianos is a satirist, so he can be over exaggerating, right? He's writing like satirical literature, but the thing is that satirists uh, usually criticize or point out things that actually do happen, right? Like for he criticizes like the morals. Uh, like various social phenomena, stuff like that. So I don't think he's completely off the base. Maybe it usually didn't take less than one day, but week or month or three years. Uh, yeah, I can definitely imagine that because this is still going on today, you know. And well, yeah, that, you, I'm you sure have, you, you, you have, can find many examples. Yeah, you have urban legends that are way less under than a year that it takes to start spreading around. But anyhow, uh, sorry, Randall. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all commonly dated to having been... Okay, uh, this is boring to me. Uh, dating is... Emperor yeah, it's important for you, some of you Christians, but not now, for me and Camille. 60, yeah, 60s. I would just and give Luke him homework, on... find out how he know, how, why he thinks he knows that uh, when Peter and Paul were murdered. When, where, by whom. What, what are the earliest sources? that answer all of these three questions specifically, not just like wake allusions to the martyrdom and uh, go read those sources. He talks about FF Bruce. Should I play that part? Mm, probably no. Yeah, when does he get, oh yeah, he, I wanna get to the creed because the creed is is the boss here. This is- Yeah, yeah, yeah. creed is the best thing that they've got. The creed is um, is actually the template for the gospels in my opinion. Would you agree with that? Well, it's actually interesting because about half of the creed doesn't show up in I, like any of the gospel, right? Like you don't have the appearance to 500. You don't have any appearance to all of the, well, that's debatable, right? But it's not the case that like in the gospel, you hit the appearances as they are narrated in the creed. So either the apostles or the, the gospel writers didn't know about the creed, which is very, very interesting, or they just decided, meh. We are not going to narrate yeah. the appearance to 500. Not that important. <laughs> okay, yeah. Here's, here's, here's a question for Christians listening. 
and this is a question I had when I was a Christian. Well, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about 500 people. This is really great evidence, right? But why does the gospel writers not mention it? Mention it? Now, some people, I think even Jonathan McClatchy has said this in the past, that he views the Pentecost narrative in the gospels as the 500, but they don't use an actual number. Have you ever heard that? It's nice and ad hoc, just the way I like it. <laughs> nice and Okay, here we go, Randall, the creed. Self. Paul says here, for what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Kephas, that is to Peter, and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Now that last verse, verse 8, Paul, it appears he's appending that or adding that as an addendum or a footnote. But the main thing that he is quoting, that he received, that he passed on, is from verses 3 to 7. Okay, do you want to say anything about the creed uh, as an introduction? Yeah, uh, so here's a question that I want answered. What is the evidence that Paul got the creed from the Jerusalem pillars as opposed to someone else? So two hypotheses. Hypothesis A, he got it from Peter when he visited him in Jerusalem. Hypothesis B, he got it from a Myron. different apostle whom he trusted a year before 1 Corinthians was written, um, probably in 50s. What is the evidence that favors hypothesis A over B? I don't think there is any, is there? Yeah, there, there isn't any like direct evidence, as in someone writes that. Uh, you can make maybe some like indirect evidence by saying that, like the way how he introduces a creed, suggests that he got it from someone who was like of, of superior authority, and like the best candidates for that would be the Jerusalem pillars. But all of that is really like a uh, really iffy. Uh, I mean, it's it's a good possibility, but. I've often heard apologists say we have every reason to believe that this this is where Paul got that creed from, or they will just say that as a fact, as if that was like on record. This is not true. Like at best, we think that the, uh, we think that this might be the case because of some like super indirect evidence that probably doesn't very po strongly point in that in that in that direction but i'm not of actually aware of any like very convincing okay. uh, arguments uh, i i'm trying to uh put myself as the christian doug here from uh, decades ago i think if you're going to agree with me christians on what i'm about to say i'm i'm going to leave, i'm going to trap you here so full armor of god up be prepared but I think if you agree with me here, you're leaving Christianity today. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Okay, um, the, the, this creed is important. True or false? True, says the Christian Doug. In fact, this, this creed is so important because it dates right back to the early, you know, to the time where it's fresh off, uh, you know, off the, the press. True or false? Yeah, true. It dates way back, a lot of people say, and yeah, yeah, I can understand. True or false, there's other creeds on this planet of amazing things happening. True or false? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I think that's true. In fact, I remember Inspiring Philosophy even admitting that there's ancient creeds of amazing feats and so forth that people believed. Okay. True or false, that creeds are a set of beliefs that might not actually be true. Uh, the Christian Doug says, yeah, I guess that's true. You can have a creed that's actually false, but people sincerely believe it. True or false, if this is the foundation, if this is the, the strong evidence, the earliest evidence we have for Christianity, and you've admitted that that doesn't necessarily mean it's true and that we have examples of other creeds that, that, um, that happened during that time frame that were not true, that we maybe shouldn't believe these creeds just because someone reports it and that this creed is the foundation for maybe the gospels being written and so forth, the traditions and the oral transmission. If you agree with all that and you agree that this is not sufficient enough evidence to warrant the claim that a man rose from the dead, I think I've given you enough reason to doubt Christianity that you're done, that you can sign up, you send your card to Wichita, Kansas, 
and I'll send you your atheist papers <laughs> or non-Christian papers. Yeah, and I just want to point out, so I have a competing explanation of the um, competing explanation to the resurrection hypothesis. And in that, I'm actually granting that the greed actually comes from the Jerusalem pillars. Uh, so I don't have to like push back against that. Uh, but like, uh, even if we grant that, Randall says this would mean it comes from like a three years after the crucifixion, which is unheard of in ancient literature. And like, we almost never have this good historical evidence. So I have here two really thick volumes with the letters of Cicero, where he Cicero, where Cicero writes about events like days after they happened. In some cases, he mentions something that just happened before he started writing a letter, right? And if in those letters he said, yeah, I've just saw, saw like a person raise, being raised from the dead with my own eyes, would we think that happened? Probably. Well, you don't even have, Camille, you don't even have to go to Cicero. You could go to, uh, I'm going to appeal to Christians listening to their own spouses. Your own spouse comes home and your own spouse says, you're not going to believe what happened. I just, this is me. You're not going to, you know, so-and-so who died like a few weeks ago. I saw them on the street just 30 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. Question. Yeah. Do you believe yeah, your spouse? A, no, of course there not. There was a... <laughs> Yeah, that, there was a video going around recently that supposedly recorded a, a resurrection. Uh, it was it, a Christian would say it was a revivification, but you know, supposedly supernatural events. And even like Christian apologists were kind of smirk about it. Like Mike Winger, for example, uh, commented that you can clearly see that the guy is faking it. But the thing is that if you actually investigate what how people were talking about it, you can realize that. There have been probably hundreds, if not thousands of people who just based on that video were sincerely convinced that an actual supernatural event took place. What's more likely that something like this happened 2000 years ago to uneducated superstitious fishermen from Galilee or that a guy was actually raised from the dead, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I want this is a bit of an aside, but we were talking about um... Uh, you know, your spouse having maybe a vision or Paul maybe having a vision or, or um, some supernatural something happening. Mike Winger just made a video recently about the Passion Translation. And he said that we should doubt it, basically. I'm going to summarize. that You should doubt it because the guy who was responsible for this translation of the Bible had a vision from God saying this is how the my word should be translated properly. And he not only had a vision from God, but he also had angels visit him saying, this is how you should go about translating my word. Now, if it's good enough for Paul, if it's good enough for Joseph and Mary to know to, to run to Egypt, why is it not good enough for this translator of the Bible who came up with the Passion Narrative. And the reason why the Christians would say, Doug, this is just foolishness, this is a bad analogy, is because they view the scriptures, what we call the Bible today, as special, as like, no, this is this is in a different category as, as a guy uh, translating the Bible. If, you, if you're not going to believe these things today, if you're not going to believe that people are raised from the dead today and you kind of laugh, yeah, this is, a, this is a hoax, I don't believe it. Why in the world would you believe it on lesser evidence from 2,000 years ago? What is wrong with you? <laughs> okay, we got to move on. So uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, the first thing I want to ask is this. Oh, a question. A second here. Uh, so how early is the teaching? How early is the teaching of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7? Um, yeah, so he goes on to I, how early is it? I think we can skip that. We've yeah. already talked about it. I, I don't, that's not a hill that I want to die on. Sure, it comes from a year after the crucifixion. Five days. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you five minutes if you want it, Randall. Uh, well, you need to you need to get at least a couple of days for them to read the Old Testament, you know, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> because that's where it comes from. <laughs> oh yeah, that's exactly right. Like even Lycona has admitted this that the resurrection is not found in the Old Testament. Is wasn't prophesied in the Old Testament. Did you know that Christians listening that the resurrection of Jesus is not prophesied in the Old Testament, and that it was 
a later reinterpretation. This is what Camille's saying. You got at least have a couple of days for the Jewish people to to okay. Let's go back to the Torah. Let's say or the the Old Testament. How how can we fit this our hero in here? Oh, let's reinterpret Isaiah fifty three. Let's reinterpret all these things to and to make Jesus fit. And he tells us in the book of Galatians this. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Kephas and stayed with him 15 yeah, days. You can skip another... this uh, past the dating uh, passage. Okay, here we go. What we need to explain. So, so what do we need to keep in mind cool. for our theory? The first thing we need to keep in mind is the rabbinic context. Okay, so I want to take a look at the rabbinic context behind this passage. The next thing that we'll have to keep in mind is that the passage says that Jesus died for our sins and he was buried. So already there's a recognition that his atoning death was uh, meritorious, that it was for our benefit, for our salvation. Yeah, you need the death and resurrection of a piece of meat in order to be saved from your sins. And that he was physically bodily laid in the ground. And then the next thing we have to explain is that he was raised, this belief that he was bodily raised. And I put in parentheses here, the tomb was found empty. Now that is not explicitly stated in the passage. Thank you, Randall. It's not explicitly stated that the tomb was found empty. I appreciate you saying that. But it is certainly implied in the passage. Because the only resurrection the Jews knew was a resurrection that would leave a tomb empty. Is that true? That you need a tomb in order to have a resurrection? Uh, no, actually, Jesus would be, like, um, I think, probably, Jesus was either placed in a mass grave or in a trench grave. You can raise from that no problem. Yeah, like you don't, you don't, you don't need to be because, like, people don't realize that the kind of tomb that Jesus was placed in was an equivalent of a golden yacht. Like only the top one percent of the Jewish elite could afford a rock cut stone, a uh, rock cut, uh, rock cut tomb, like cut in inside a stone, right? Yeah, and, and if you're... you don't ha you don't have to have that in order to raise be raised from the dead, you know. And like if people you're... are raised from the dead even today, supposedly from all kinds of tombs and graves and stuff like that. Right, and if you're a Christian listening and you're you're screaming out Joseph of Arimathea and you're screaming out all these other things, but we have eyewitnesses and we have people going to tombs and stuff, you're missing Randall's point here. Right now, we're looking at First Corinthians 15 as our evidence under examination. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot import the Gospels, which were um, uh, written later. We're looking at the uh, primary source, Paul, written the earliest, way earlier than the Gospels, and it does not mention a tomb. And how impotent would Yahweh have to be if you need a tomb to raise someone? Um, yeah, you can throw someone in a ditch and still raise them if you're God. Number four, Jesus was seen alive again by his followers. And this is really interesting, even by some skeptics. And I'll talk about the skeptics in a moment. <laughs> and then the fifth I mean, thing... Now I'm actually thinking, like, even, let's say hypothetically, even though I don't think this is the case, let's say hypothetically that Jesus was left on the cross to decompose. And then, like, his body, like, his corpse was revived. That would still count as if he, him being raised. Yes, because being great, like it doesn't, it doesn't literally mean that you stand up. It just means that your body goes from being dead to being alive again. Yes, and this is another side. I'm just uh, the dopamine's running so high right now. I'm just gonna give my thoughts. This is an aside, but when it comes to resurrections, when people ask, "What would it take for me to change my mind?" I think my new one is is going to be my sister's death. My sister died two, three weeks ago. Christians, pray in the name of Jesus that she be raised from the dead. You don't even have to dig up the grave. You can just pray. Miracles happen, right? So she rises, raises from the dead. She comes back to life, and poof, she's above ground. She, she hitchhikes or walks to the closest uh, wherever and says, hey, look, I'm alive. If that happens, sign me up for Christianity because <laughs> that would be an amazing miracle. We need to explain is the fact that this teaching about Jesus, that he had died for their sins, that he had been raised, and that he was seen by eyewitnesses, this teaching radiated out from Jerusalem throughout the empire. So those are the things that we need to explain. Let's talk first about... Do you want to try to explain them now? Uh, sure. Do you want me to? Yeah, in 60 seconds or less, give a natural explanation for First Corinthians 15. 
Uh, for First Corinthians 15 specifically, right? So early Christians believe the Old Testament is a historical reliable source of information about Jesus, and they mistook their religious experiences as a confirmation of their belief. The Old Testament says that Messiah will suffer for sins of others, will be humiliated and killed, and raised, lifted up, and highly exalted in heaven. Jesus really did, was despised and rejected, tortured, st stricken, and spat upon. He died as a lamb. Uh, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and his hands were pierced. Uh, and like from that, Christians became convinced that a number of passages in the Old Testament talk about Jesus. So they concluded that others are as well, including the ones that suggest uh, that he would be raised, lifted up, and highly exalted in heaven. And then where I do like I'm granting that First Corinthians 15 uh, actually does describe a number of experiences that people had. Uh, the problem is it doesn't tell you where, when, what amount of time expired between these individual appearances. So there is a number of natural phenomena that can account for it. Uh, that but the are 500 were at the same time, Camille. Explain that. Yeah, cool. Uh, I'm granting that, even though that's probably not a part of the original mm -hmm. creed. Uh, that comes from someone else, either Paul or someone else. Uh, you don't have to appeal to hallucinations that only exist in the mind. There is a number of extra mental phenomena that 500 people can see at the same time. One example is pareidolia, which is a, a ubiquitous human tendency to recognize uh, information as a meaningful pattern. And we have many examples of pareidolia with religious significance in Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, where people see religious figures, including Jesus, in like a large number of objects. When they talking about it, they always talking, or they often also talking about it in such a way that you can't actually tell just from the way how they talk about it if they are talking about pareidolia or actually seeing the like a uh, epiphany or revelation of that divine figure. Uh, typical examples: Marianic apparitions. You have thousands of people at the same time who will tell you that they saw Mary. But what they actually saw were like lights in the sky or something like that. Yes. And if you only have them saying that, you will never know what was the actual, expl like if Mary really appeared, you know. Uh, but in cases where we can investigate it, it's very often the case that this is just pareidolia. And because of the religious milieu, the religious, you know, um, environment, uh, that gets, gets interpreted as uh, an epiphany of a divine being. Can you summarize that in 10 seconds now? So basically, a natural explanation is that people really didn't see Jesus, but they might have saw something, in, even in a group. Um, yeah. And they reinterpreted their uh, incoming biases of being a, a certain sect of Judaism as saying, hey, their hero is now dead, but we've experienced him in this way. Yeah, my, my explanation goes from confirmation uh, through reinterpretation of the Old Testament to uh, like um, confirmation by some religious experience. And if we want to say, sure, there were 500 people who saw something at the same time, you can either go from for some kind of like Pentecostal type revival or like charismatic experience, or you can just go for pareidolia. Depends uh, if you like um, Pentecostals more or Catholics more, you know. <laughs> and yeah, and if you're a Christian listening and you just think that what Camille said is rubbish, let me see how consistent you are in your epistemology. I mentioned a flying man. A guy wrote about a flying man about 20 years after he flew, but he has a creed about the flying man that dates back to a few years after he actually flew. And, he, and it says this guy wrote tw a couple decades later, that 500 people saw the flying man f fly. He doesn't mention their names. Uh, he doesn't say what the appearance actually it was. Christians, if you don't believe that that man actually flew in history based on that type of evidence, why on earth? Based, remember, we're excluding everything else. We're just looking at 1 Corinthians 15 right now. Everything else has got a mind wipe. If you're not going to believe the flying man, you should not believe that Jesus rose from the dead based on 1 Corinthians 15. You shouldn't. If you want to be consistent, yeah, and no, you know, like um, I can imagine that a lot of Christians will think that uh, believing that you are actually seeing Jesus just because you are seeing a, an instance of pareidolia is really stupid. It's like a dumb explanation. 
I agree, but then you are calling like thousands and thousands of your fellow Christians stupid because this is what's happening like all the time. You know, like we have yep. many well documented instances. I, I think Jesus's disciples being unreasonable and jumping to a conclusion, even though they were not properly justified, is a more probable explanation for the origin of their belief in the resurrection than an actual resurrection. Right? Like I think people being unreasonable happens a little bit more often than people actually raising from the dead. Jesus. Especially if we are yeah, if we are talking about like fishermen from two thousand years ago. Jesus appears to more than five hundred people every Sunday morning in a Pentecostal church, at least before the virus hit. Okay, let's go. Yeah. yeah. Of the rabbinic context. And to talk about this point, I want to first address another thing I often hear from skeptics. They say, well, isn't this whole thing just kind of like the telephone game? You know, you whisper in one person's ear. Yeah, no, th that's not relevant here. <laughs> um, rabbinic context. Should we talk about that? Nah. I got the... Jesus died for our sins and was... But what's he saying here? Uh, there was an article written back in 1986. In the Swoon Journal. theory. You can skip oh, all of that. Yeah, so if yeah. you're a Christian and you mention things like swoon theory, uh, uh, what else do they mention? He wasn't really... Yeah. I'm, so I'm so frustrated by it. Uh, like, just a couple of days ago, there there is a new publication. There was a, a new publication, like new book about the resurrection from Christian apologist. Looks super sophisticated. He, it claims to be interdisciplinary, so it like the 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 pitch is that it combines uh, findings from multiple different disciplines like history, psychology, and stuff like that. Super excited to read it. I skipped ninety percent of the book because it just went over the things that I'm granting for the sake of argument, like Jesus actually dying and stuff like that. Get to the most interesting part. What do I, do I find in it? Refutation of the swoon theory, of the conspiracy theory, of the stolen body theory. Come on, like that, that's just rehashing looks at the same well, stuff. How, how often do you skip parts of books, Camille? I almost never do, uh, okay. to be honest. But like I've read Lacona, Habermas, I don't have to read the same stuff over and over, especially if it's about things that I think atheists don't actually need to push against. Because even if you grant them for the sake of argument, it's still very implausible, improbable, that Jesus would be raised. And you can very easily come up f with all kinds of explanations that can account for all of the evidence, but are much more plausible. Because they don't actually involve uh, like a guy raising from the dead. They, for example, involve like people not being reasonable and jumping to conclusions because they exist in like a particular religious background. Um, I just want, I have one of them. So, yeah. Okay, I want to see what he's saying here about uh, Deuteronomy. You must hang his body on a tree. You must not leave the body on the tree overnight, but you must be sure to bury him that day. Because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not defile the land that the Lord your... Oh, uh, yeah, he's basically saying here that uh, the Jews had this idea that um, it's, you need to bury it right away. So that he's giving evidence that, that Jesus was probably taken off the cross and wasn't left to hang there, right? Is that where he's going? Yeah, and he's he's pointing out a contradiction in the Bible, where in Deuteronomy it says that, uh, like, if someone is hanged on a tree, uh, he's cursed by God. But then, like, was Jesus really cursed by God? You know. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let me point that. <laughs> But you must be sure to bury him that day, because anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Is there? What, how do they get out of that? Jesus was cursed by God. Well, they they would probably special plead, right? Like they would say it doesn't. This doesn't apply to Jesus. Yeah, it doesn't apply to Jesus, but it does apply to Jesus when we need him to get off that cross and into a tomb soon. <laughs> No, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense because it argues for the practice of taking uh, like a crucified victims from crosses, which like fine, uh, works for me. Uh, but uh, like, honestly, I think if you could travel back in time and talk to early Christians and you ask them, like, do you think Jesus was under God's curse, uh, you know, based on that passage, there is a good chance they would say yes. They would actually say Jesus had to be under God's curse because otherwise he wouldn't be able to atone, atone for sins of humanity, you know? Like, he had to actually take on that curse. I don't really see that as, a, like, a theological problem. Okay, uh, let's get to the good news. 
it became good news because it was not the end of the story. So the next point we want to look at is that Jesus was raised and the tomb was found empty. Okay, now we're off for uh, Corinthians 15 and we're back into the Gospels. Now, the first thing we want to appreciate here is, is what resurrection means for, uh, or being raised, what that meant for a first century Jew. What it meant is a general resurrection, a bodily resurrection. As Jesus himself said, a time is coming. and Yeah, bodily resurrection is very, very important. Not spiritual resurrection. It has to be bodily. The amino acids, the proteins, had to die and rise again in order for sins to be uh, redeemed. That just bo yeah, boggles is, my mind that meat has to be... This is, <laughs> this is another point where apologists shoot themselves in the foot, right? So they, they want to combat the, the possibility that the Gospels could be talking about the spiritual resurrection. And the way how they do that is just uh, arguing from a cultural context. So they'll say, yeah, the like early Christians were, uh, you know, Second Temple Jews. And when Second Temple Jews were talking about bo resurrections, they were talking about bodily resurrections. So it's very implausible that they would be talking about spiritual resurrections. But the problem is that if you, like, cl argue this way, and I think it's probably correct, then that explains where the idea of the bodily resurrection comes from. You don't actually need a bodily resurrection to explain why the first Christians became convinced that Jesus uh, was raised bodily. You know, it would be like uh, here's a like an analogy, right? Let's say that a bunch of stoners go outside uh, to, to a forest late at night, and they see some light in the sky. What they are actually seeing is planet Venus, but because they are huge X Files fans they come to like a mistaken belief that they are actually seeing uh, an alien spacecraft. What yeah. explains their belief is the fact that they already have this like cultural background, you know, being massive X-Files fans. So you don't actually need an alien spacecraft there to explain why they formed that belief. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. So there was a small sect of Judaism that reinterpreted the Old Testament to fit the narrative of their hero. And uh, so you don't need a, but I, I still think that when Christians really mean and say that they need a bodily resurrection, otherwise Christianity is, is bunk. What they're really saying is I need a piece of meat to die and rise again on the third day in order for the creator of the universe to say, now, now your sins are forgiven. Now that this meat has died and rose again, because we are more than just meat. We are however you want to view it, souls and spirits and wills and minds and, uh, yeah. But it's the meat that counts when it comes to uh, wiping sins away. Like, I, I think that alone, you should say, you know what, I'm out. <laughs> you, know what, when, you know what's really weird about it? That, like, Christianity is the only religion that thinks that. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if we found out that, like all kinds of religions from all over the world, like ancient China, ancient Mesoamerica, like they all believed that um, like a, a sacrifice, like a death of a body and its resurrection is what's needed to solve like a, a problem of evil, essentially, right? But we don't have that. The only religion that thinks this is significant, I think thinks that because that's the religion where the founders needed to explain this one specific death, you know? Uh, this isn't like a universal religious concept. It's just found in one religion that comes from like specific historical circumstances, you know? Where, yeah, there was a death. The guy really was killed. His followers needed to explain that. So they developed this theology for why it's important. And that's why it's only found in this one religion and nowhere else in the world, you know? That's so what you would expect if this is what was actually going on. But would you really expect it if, like, Christianity was metaphysically true? Uh, Jesus was raised, the tomb was found empty. Uh, I, all, all I have to say here is this is not a minimal fact uh, uh, espoused by the consensus of scholars, right? So Yeah, you... that, that's, that's, that's Randall knows that from personal experience, uh, from, yeah, like, personal question. revelation. In your spiritual experiences, Randall, is this how you know the tomb was found empty, or are you relying on the historical text? My guess is you're relying on the historical text, which is not a minimal fact adhered by your heroes like Habermas and uh, Turek. <laughs> I shouldn't say they're his heroes, but you sure sound like them, uh, Randall. 
Uh, let's see here. Jesus was seen alive again by followers and some skeptics. Let's see what he has to say here. And they ended up dying for this faith. Oh, he went straight to martyrdom. Peter, uh, Peter as well was likely martyred in Rome under Nero. What changed Peter? Yeah, we don't know if he had a chance to recant. We've been through all this a thousand times. Yeah, and I mean, with martyrdom, uh, f like being wrong feels exactly like being right. So, mar like the argument for martyrdom, at best, it's a good, uh, good, uh, like um, argument against the conspiracy theory, right? So the idea that, let's say, the disciples just made it up for material gain. But I would be arguing that they were just sincerely mistaken. They really believed that. I mean, if if you get yourself killed, there's heaven waiting for you, right? So why wouldn't you go through martyrdom? Uh, by the way, we're getting the, close to the end of this. So if you have questions, tag me. And uh, we have uh, a historian, Camille, here to answer your questions. Not a historian. This is very important. I misspoke earlier, and I'm still bothered by that. <laughs> Should not be calling myself yeah. a historian. No, we'll, we'll, we'll call you just a guy who uh, maybe knows more than the average guy okay uh teaching about jesus spread from jerusalem is this a kind of an argument from popularity jerusalem it didn't start in antioch it didn't start in tarsus it didn't start in alexandria or or rome or somewhere else no it actually radiated out from jerusalem and this in and of itself is a fascinating detail why so let's now put on our why is it fascinating because it's like uh i guess the idea is that if like people at the time would be in a position to know if it wasn't true. Like oh, there would be someone yes. who would, could debunk it, which I, I mean, okay, sure. So let, let's say that the Jews actually take the time out of their busy lives to find and dig up Jesus's body, you know, after 50 days, because that's the amount of time which uh, took place between the crucifixion and when Christians first started proclaiming the, the resurrection, according to Acts, the body would be pretty de much decomposed, right? Let's say you show it to Peter. What's more likely? Do you think he's going to do complete 180 and like reject uh, Jesus and everything that he spent like a couple of years, uh, like, you know, what, what his life was about? Or is it more likely he would just dismiss it as a satanic deception? Like, call me crazy, there are Christians today who believe the Earth is flat and that all of the evidence for a globe is actually a part of like a very, very elaborate um, satanic deception. Because after all, like the world that we live in is controlled by the rulers of the age, right? Which are like Satan and his minions. And they are trying to trick you into uh, like abandoning the, abandoning the one true faith. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip to the end here. What's the best that explains all these facts about 1 Corinthians 15, the Gospels, and so forth? Uh, my advice to Christians listening is to go back to the flying man. And what best explains the flying man? That there was a guy who wrote about the flying man and created a creed about 20 years after about the flying man. That the, there was uh, uh, reports for different diaries uh, that people saw the flying man and went to the, the cliff site where the flying man landed and... Um, and all the the flying man appeared to 500 uh, people at this at the same time. What best explains all this facts? Legend, wrong uh, cliff site where the flying man landed, uh, that the flying man actually didn't fly, or uh, there was a conspiracy that everybody uh, decided to write these books about the flying man and it didn't really happen and they kept quiet about it. That there was visions of the flying man, uh, or that the man actually flew. <laughs> What? Yeah, and also, uh, just uh, like if you're a Christian, try to come up with the best naturalistic explanation for Mormonism and for ancient Gnosticism, actually. Because, you know, like Christian apologists sometimes say stuff like early Christians would never lie. Like they, they would, for example, never write, like forge an account in someone else's name. Well, you know, where did, did all that uh, non-canonical -canonical literature came from? It was written by Christians who had apparently no trouble like forging documents in someone else's name. So what's the best naturalistic explanation for that? Um, you know? Let me take this off here. Actually, okay, so let's, uh, 
let's look at questions. I think I saw one from Laura who asked, what's your background? You're, uh, you're actually very similar to Laura, right? In terms of what? Going to graduate school? And... No, I, I do already have a PhD, but it's an unrelated discipline. And uh, now I'm just studying uh, ancient history and ancient Greek philology, but so far on the undergraduate level. But in a couple of years, I will have my PhD in this. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Do we know where Jesus' tomb is today? Uh, yeah, there's a, I think, um, Stupid Horror Energy asked that. I think uh, there's three uh, sites where people try to make money for from American I know, tourists. I know about two. Uh, one of, but one of them was only like people only started saying that, as far as I know, in the 20th century, right? So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, dates to the fourth century, uh, and it was probably like uh, founded or uh, the site was picked by when like during Constantine's time. It's actually interesting because Eusebius, the famous church historian, was personally involved in that. Interesting story. Unfortunately, we will never know uh, like we can never go further back than the fourth century, because basically, it, like already by the first century, Christians completely destroyed the tomb when they were building the church. So they like, excavated a tomb. They, for some reason, identified it as a tomb of Jesus, even though there are like bunch of other tombs around okay, it okay, and okay. below it. We gotta move on. And yeah, they just built a church on top of it. Oh. So the original t tomb is gone. Everyone needs a small ask. Do you think apologists are historically illiterate or just rely on the same biased sources? I think apologists are so desirous for this to be true so they can have their guilt relieved, their sins forgiven, hope, meaning, purpose of an eternal life, that if it sounds plausible to them, they'll go with it, they'll run with it. And, and also, also very few apologists actually have like a relevant education. Uh, I would say Mike Lacona it's one like one that yeah absolutely has the credentials that one should have but he's like very very rare in this in that respect sanjeev asks i thought the res this resurrection thing was also taken from some greek philosophy yeah philo of alexandria platonism judaism the, that's where you get logos the first son of for, the, the the earliest concept of the trinity sort of so pre-christian very interesting yeah Remember, tag me if you have questions. Otherwise, it's harder for me to see. Pine Creek is so rude. <laughs> well, stupid horror energy. Cause she's saying that because I cut you off. But I, um, I think it. We can get more questions in the faster we go. But maybe there isn't any questions. Maybe everybody's watching this is already. Uh, uh, we're just preaching to the choir. Are there any Christians here who, um, who have take issue with anything we've said? And if so, what? Yeah, good point, uh, Sanjeev, that I think a lot of people are desirous to believe this stuff because they've had a experience in their life that makes them more likely to believe it. So they've, I think a lot of Christians think they've seen angels or demons. I think a lot of Christians think that um, they've seen some paranormal activity that convinces them that the supernatural is out there. I think there's a lot of Christians who believe that... Um, people have been to heaven and back or hell and back and reported it. Yeah. Uh, uh, homework for Christians, look up new apostolic reformation. Uh, that's a, like a very extreme view, even among like very extreme movement, even among evangelicals, like even evangelicals, like charism charismatics think that this is heretical because there, it's a bunch of people running around claiming they are apostles. They are essentially like on the same level as Peter and Paul. And they very often claim to have like visions and appearances of Jesus, including like Jesus physically like touching them and stuff like that. Uh, people like Brand Simmons that you mentioned, uh, Mike Bickle. How do you explain that? Like, do you think this is actually going on? Do you think they are actually apostles? Do you think they are faking it? Do you think they are like mentally ill? Yeah. Try to come up with a naturalistic explanation. Yeah. Or do you think they are like deceived by Satan? 
and see if that explanation is going to work equally that's, well for Peter and Paul. That's the answer most, uh, not most, a lot of Christians would give that it's some type of demon thing. But it, yeah, absolutely. But that's a great point. It's there are people today who who will tell you that they have that Jesus appeared to them bodily, not just in a dream. In fact, I know one person who's told me that. And do you believe that, Christians? That Jesus appeared to some people today in bodily form? And if not, why are you so skeptical? <laughs> and I think one, one thing that like, like a Christian would say is that Mike Bickle was never martyred for his beliefs. So we don't actually know if he would recant or not. And I suggest we find out. Find out what? <laughs> if he would. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was a joke. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was reading the live stream chat, chat too. Um, of course, in Minecraft, not in real life. Oh, Minecraft. Do you think, hypothetically, if the Pharisees bought, brought out the body of Jesus, Christians would deny it and believe the resurrection anyway? I think well, so. Well, I mean, I'm thinking there are Christians who deny all of the evidence for the flat earth. So, <laughs> for the uh, spherical earth, right? So, it seems to me like there are Christians who are very good at this. <laughs> like, when it comes to dismissing evidence that contradicts your uh, religious belief. Yeah, this is, this is actually a great point from Jake the Snake. Oh, love your name. That brings me back to, uh, I'm old enough to know what you're referring to there. Um, the... Do you think that hypothetically, if the Pharisees brought out the body of Jesus, Christians would deny it? I often ask, what are the markers in your life that would change your mind? So Christians, if you're listening, what would change your mind and throw Christianity away? Say, I'm done. I've had enough. No, Christianity is not true. What would you have to learn? What would you have to see? What would you have to find out? And a lot of Christians tell me, well, if they uncovered the bones of Jesus. And I say, well, that's a great start, but how would you know that these are actually the bones of Jesus? Even if it said, here lies the king of the Jews, you open up the box, and there's the bones of, the, of Jesus, uh, bones in there. And let's say if it's, it's even radiocarbon dated or dated to the first century. You Seriously? Just based on that one inscription and, uh, car and carbon dating? You know, you couldn't do carbon dating. Well, maybe. Depends. What, wouldn't you say that this is faked? This is why I think in order, and uh, Laura Robinson mentioned this too, in order to get there, in order to say you have knowledge that this is true or not, it has to be something today, does it not, for such a claim like this? And I really think a lot of Christians actually do believe in Christianity, not because of the historical text. They use the historical method to not feel stupid about what they believe. They use philosoph uh, philosophical arguments not to feel stupid for what they believe. But the real reason they believe, I think, is from pers some personal experience, which a lot of them admit. It's the intertestimony of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and I think the question, like, would uh, Jesus' disciple be convinced if the body was produced? I think what's very important to realize is that it would be produced by the authorities, either Jewish or Roman. And, like, uh, a feature of uh, Second Temple Jewish apocaly apocalypticism was the view that the, like, um, like, political authorities are essentially, like, being controlled by the forces of Satan. Like, there was a very strong implicit distrust to, to them. Uh, which like massively complicates this kind of view. I think it's obvious. I again, it's much more probable that they would just dismiss it and Christianity would still exist than a guy being raised from the dead, you know? Yeah. Jonathan Dupu is here. Doesn't everyone believe what they believe at base, Theo? What does that mean? I don't know what you mean, Jonathan. I think you're missing a few letters. Hey, Reed, more so belonging in a moral community rather than personal experience. Yes, Reed, I think that's another reason why people believe what they believe. It's, um, well, it, it boils down to hope, meaning, and purpose. You get meaning and purpose from being inside a community. 
And maybe given that we have like a, a bunch of Christians uh, watching, so I, I've said a couple of times how like improbable it is that a guy would be raised from the dead. I'm of course granting that Yahweh specifically, so the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as of all some, some other God exists. And uh, there are actually resurrections sometimes going on, right? So even if you grant that, the problem is, it seems to be resurrections are exceedingly rare. So if you have two historical hypotheses and one of them relies on something that we know almost never happens and the other one relies on things that it seems to me are going on all the time like with the thick people and their uh, the way how they form beliefs we should probably prefer this one as being the more probable you know so you don't actually have to be an atheist you don't have to even deny that yahweh exists you know the god that christians worship and it, I think the resurrection is still very improbable, much less probable than other explanations. That is so incredibly reasonable, uh, Camille. And this is why yeah. this is... Uh, th there are millions of people who worship the same God, and they still don't think that Jesus is raised. They are called the Jews. You don't have to be an atheist uh, in order to become convinced that Jesus probably wasn't raised. Well, no even, even within Christianity, you don't even have to go to Judaism. You ask, what is God like? What is the nature of this loving God? What is he really like? It depends on what Christian you ask that question to. And they'll tell you what God is like because they have a personal relationship with God, but it seems uh, quite a bit different than the God that uh, a different Christian explains. Um, it sounds like Laura Robinson put a hole through her wall after listening to us. <laughs> Um, the real reason to watch Pine Creek. Oh, what's your PhD in? Someone would ask that. Uh, political science. Okay. What's your undergraduate degree in? The same. Okay. So we got a political scientist, uh, Dr. Camille, and a two master's degree in finance and analytical chemistry telling you why um, Christianity should be doubted. Mountain Show, Doug, why didn't Jesus just stay on Earth? Jesus could be living uh, atheist de debunker by staying on earthly realm. What was his? Well, he is on Earth, Mountain Show, in the hearts of billions of Christians. Man, some people just don't get it, Camille, that Jesus is already here. <laughs> I think he wants the, the fleshy Jesus, you know. Um, Jonathan tries again. Doesn't everyone believe what they believe from what they've experienced in a certain sense? Yes, I would agree with that. The thing is, do we have defeaters for what we believe? How do we separate, as uh, my friend uh, T-Jump says, how do we separate the thoughts in our head? How do we separate our imagination for something outside of us? That's the key. Yeah, uh, Scott Duke, I think I understand your question. Um, you're getting to the mystery of God. You know, maybe like people always uh, like often often point out that there are some beliefs that you just know on personal experience. Like you love your wife, you know that you like you made the right decision when you decided to marry her and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. Like, can you give me any other example about something that happened two thousand years ago? Like, it seems to me that when people draw these kinds of analogies, they always draw them with, like, a very particular types of claims that have to do with, you know, one's uh, internal, like, psychological um, things. But we don't really have, like, that's really not comparable, you know. Uh, we don't, uh, this is not how we, like, find out what happened uh, in history. How can you afford to get two PhDs? What the heck must be? Oh, no, he's in Eastern Europe, and in there, education's free. They're, the, like, they're, so, you're, you're, they're socialist yeah, you're, commies. You're actually getting paid when you're doing your PhD, and you like you don't acquire any debt for it because it's free. Debt. What would you say? Debt? <laughs> I sometimes forget that Camille's... Uh... What's your first language? Well, Czech, obviously. Yeah, I know for me it's obvious, but for people listening. Yeah, yeah, check. I'm based in Prague. So how old were you when you learned English? Well, I, well I've been learning it since, since I was like 10, but I think I d really like it. 
it's really jumped. Well, actually, when YouTube started uh, about 2009, I think YouTube probably made the biggest difference because I just started like watching stuff in English without subtitles or anything like that. Jonathan Depuz, I think, likes my answer I gave him, but says I'm not making a historical claim. Um, as a Christian, I think I asked you if you believed in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I think you did say yes. Can, can we actually ask a question to Laura? So she said uh, she uh, like almost put her head through a wall, right? Yeah, I think it was something specific. She said something what, about Jewish authorities or something. Was it was it because of what we said, or was it because of what Randall said? <laughs> I don't know. I think she's. I think she. Uh, she loves me, but I think she didn't like what something you said about Jewish authorities. But I, I know that there's nothing I've said that would ever bother Laura Robinson. I think the categories of history and theology are being getting blended here. Oh, I'm all for a multidisciplinary approach, you know. I think we can take the findings of theology and uh, import them into history. For example, we can find out that Yahweh has a very strong tendency not to trace people from the dead just by a way of natural theology, you know. Just like the, the same way you, uh, you like construct the fine-tuning argument um, you can like use the same kind of theological methodology for establishing that uh, resurrections are probably extremely rare and Yahweh almost never performs them. Uh, thin Box Dictator says, Jesus loves me is not analogous to my wife loves me. It is more like the text is in this tract is directly for me. Yeah, a Thin Box director from the Christian point of view, they would say Jesus loves me is, they would agree with you that it's not analogous to my wife loves me. It's even more powerful. The love of Jesus is more strong, stronger than your spouse, the love your spouse could ever give you because he is the creator of the universe who has spent every minute, every second of every minute of every hour of every day of, uh, of every year of your life caring about you. Your, your spouse doesn't do that. There's some days your spouse hates you. Jesus never hates you unless you're not, Unless you're a Calvinist who doesn't, who says that uh, Jesus hates the non-elect, he didn't die for the non-elect. He died for the elect. Don't you know? Uh, yeah, I would say that the, the claim "my uh, wife, my spouse loves me" is not equivalent to the claim, you know, the Romans conquered Syracuse in twelve uh, two twelve, which is something that we don't know for sure. Actually, like there is like at least uh, the range is like almost two years on that. Laura Rum said, I don't think we should say, well, the Pharisees would have presented the body of Jesus to the disciples. I think she's actually mad at some of uh, the uh, different comment in the live stream chat. We never said Oh, that. yeah. I don't, I, I, like, I'm not claiming that it's very probable that like, the Pharisees would go, would go dig up Jesus' body because we don't know what happened to it, really. Like, but you can construct like plausible scenarios. Like, for example, in one debate, Bar Ehrman just said, for all we know, uh, some of the relatives from, like of Joseph of Arimathea found out that a criminal was buried in his uh, in their family tomb. So on Friday night, they just decided to go and grab the body and toss it in the common grave. They were stopped by a Roman guard. The guard killed them on the spot. And because they didn't want to have like any tr go through any troubles, they disposed of all the bodies like during the night. So like in the morning, the only thing that was different was that the tomb was empty and that there was a bunch of people that went missing from Joseph of Arimathea's family. Nobody ever found out what happened to them. Nobody recorded it. And the rest is history, you know. You can even get the empty tomb. Like I'm not, I don't think the empty tomb is historical because I, I guess you can uh, find, I think you can f um, see how that uh, narrative is being constructed from the Old Testament. But if you really like the empty tomb, you can still have it. That's fine. <laughs> and by the way, the guards were only placed at the tomb the next morning, which means you still have hours and hours when the tomb was <laughs> being unguarded. Uh, 
Yeah, like guys yeah. like Camille and I don't believe there ever was a tomb. At least I don't. Uh, and but if you're going to go down that road, oh, uh, here's a naturalistic explanation: the guards were placed uh, according to Matthew at the tomb uh, the next day, or let's say ten hours later. It was stolen during that time. Boom, done. And it was stolen by people who were themselves killed later for stealing a body, so nobody found out like, yeah, what happened, you know. Is it that isn't that more probable than uh, a man rising from the dead? Of course it is, and Christians, you know it is. Yeah, I, I, I like. I'm not saying this is more probable than not. I'm not saying it's the only explanation. Do, like, should I believe that this is what happened? Probably not. But like, come on, like, is it more probable than guy raising from the dead? Even if you think that uh, resurrections happen and Yahweh exists. Yeah, and I understand that. Uh, uh... The more advanced, educated uh, Christians don't even believe there were gods at the tomb. William Lane Craig doesn't believe there were gods at the tomb. Or maybe he does, but he he acknowledges that historians don't believe that. And, and by the way, um, so you, you mentioned what would make you, like, what would increase your confidence, right? So what would increase mine? I think what would really work for me is if you could um, raise my, uh, like, epistemic credence about uh, a god such as Yahweh being being interested in raising someone like Jesus from the dead as opposed to like a random person, you know, like my grandma, she's probably not going to be raised even if Yahweh exists, let's be honest, before, of course, the second coming, you know. Uh, so why think that Jesus would be an exception? Because and he was like, famous. Yeah, well, Christians can give you a story. But the problem is that you have to establish that the story about why Yahweh would be interested in raising Jesus, as, as opposed to just the next guy, uh, that story is probably true independently from establishing that Jesus was raised. Otherwise, you're just begging the question, you know. But the problem is that the story about why that happened was being told primarily by early Christians who already believed that Jesus was raised. So you don't have like independent evidence that would motivate your confidence in believing that Yahweh would be interested in raising someone like Jesus in the first place, which like wasn't produced by people who already believed that happened. So of course, Christians would claim that, yeah, Yahweh would totally raise Jesus because they already believed that Jesus was raised. You know, yeah. this is the biggest problem for me. Yes. Um, you, yeah. And here, and you're getting to the out for Christians. Because uh, after Christians watch this video, of course, they're going to feel, ah, maybe I should leave Christianity now because Camille is just so incredibly reasonable and so is Pine Creek. I think I have to leave Christianity now if if my reason is the historical method. And um, you're out as this. Camille just said it. You can still believe in Yahweh. Become a Jew or a Muslim. Or you can become a deist and still think, ah, oh, there has to be a basis, a non-contingent thing or whatever for everything. But it's the evidence is not sufficient for this claim of a man rising from the dead, and that's the linchpin for Christianity. So I'm out. But I'm still I'm not going to become a dirty atheist like Camille and Doug because that's just crazy. Or you can like I don't have anything against Christians. Uh, what the only thing that's I bothering me? Uh, sorry, I said I sleep with one, so I don't have anything yeah, against Christians uh, either. I, I I don't, but as far as I know, but uh, yeah, I don't have anything against Christians. The only thing that's really like wraps me the wrong way is Christians apologists, Christian apologists who specifically claim that the resurrection is something like is is a conclusion that's warranted by the application of the historical method. I think that's false. So you can even be a Christian, just don't think that the methods of history will get you there. Because well, I think yeah, if you, actually... you sound like Laura Robinson. I'm going to push back on you here. Okay. And, it, and you even will, I think, are going to backtrack on this because you said it yourself when we first started this live stream with Randall Rouser. Make a list of the things you know about Jesus from your personal experiences. Guys like Randall Rouser would be hard-pressed to know anything at all about God slash Jesus slash the Holy Spirit if it wasn't for the traditions and the texts found from the first, second, third centuries. In fact, I dare say almost nothing. And so this, these are historical claims. If you think there, that Jesus is God incarnate, that's a historical claim because Jesus is a historical person that the God had to be incarnate into. Yeah, no, no I, I, I'm not saying that 
like if you get rid of the historical method that you are going to be left with good reasons you know like the reasons for being christians are yeah. still going to be bad it's just like i'm interested about what happened in the past and if i see people being wrong about that on the internet my eyes starts to twitch <laughs> and I, i need to go stream with pine creek you know <laughs> i i got to give out a thousand pine points to 10 hands welcome here i don't remember seeing your name before but welcome he makes the point do any evidentialists ever say that uh, the resurrection of jesus christ should be taught in history class great great point if if you are a Christian who says the evidence for Christianity, the historical evidence for Christianity is so strong that it's basically a fact of history, then you should advocate that it be taught at the, at the high school level to start with, and even in college, uh, public colleges, that this is part of history, the resurrection of a man named Jesus. But we don't see that, do we? Is it because it's just the, the education system is run by Satan? Is that the reason or why? The reason is because most people disagree with you. That's the reason. Uh, actually, fun fact, I looked up online the textbook that I was uh, using when I was uh, in high school, elementary school, actually. So about like, well, younger than 15. And I looked up uh, what, like how, how early Christianity is being discussed. And interestingly enough, the text uh, like it's the text is written and it, as if the empty tomb was like a historical fact <laughs> which okay. is weird uh hang on a second i got to um start the music soon but iron charioteer asks ask camille does what does he think of jesus being a warrior king just like the jews wanted and was killed as a, a political and military offender uh okay so i would have to <laughs> need more like is so is that is the hypothesis that he was uh like a, a violent uh yeah see, military leader see i i think i think the early small sect of jews had a pivot on the old testament because it's pretty hard to get an earthly king at least like how how would you it would be very difficult to get jesus to the king position conquer the Roman army, get his face and name on a coin. That's just too much work. So let's just pivot and say that it's a heavenly king, uh, not an earthly king. Or, or say that the earthly kingdom is going to come later. Uh, that makes life so much easier to, uh, to just pivot on the Old Testament like that. Well, yeah, Bart, Bart Ehrman has a hypothesis that the reason why Judas betrayed Jesus was because he wanted to force his hand into a violent, rev violent revolution. Like Judas didn't get, didn't get it. He was expecting Jesus to start like doing something, and because he did, Jesus wasn't. He decided, okay, if I go and tell on him basically to the Jewish authorities, this is going to like provoke Jesus to actually start doing something. But uh, you know, we know how it ended up. Like, do I think this is probably true? no i have no like no way of knowing it's an interesting speculation you can make like a lot of speculations like that i don't know i have no idea <laughs> it's camille with a k not a c uh brian stevens um oh by the way i'll be talking to jonathan dupu and emilio ramos on either tomorrow at was it 3 30 eastern or friday at 1 30 eastern i gotta re double check the emails but as you guys know i never i very rarely get people a lot of <laughs> heads up when i'm going live um and i i will find that fascinating because here we have two Christians who have, I think, in my opinion, two completely different views of who God and Jesus is. Emilio Ramos is a guy, I believe, who will say that Jesus hates some people. He, like, he hates some people because when he looks at some people, all he sin sees is uh, depraved nature. He's a Reformed Calvinist uh, type of guy, whereas Jonathan's not. He, Jonathan's like, Jesus loves everybody, and he's like he wants to love you and have a relationship with you and that sort of thing. And so, but I think they both use a very similar method to get to where they're, to their knowledge of who Jesus is. 
And so can I make a pre- can I make a prediction about the discussion? I think uh, like when when these guys are talking to us, they would say that they like their justifications comes from personal revelation. But I think tomorrow they will if they come into like if they come to a point of friction or disagreement, they will immediately go back to the Bible to resolve it. No, I don't think so. My prediction, if they're smart, they will not talk to each other at all and just gang up on me. <laughs> That's what they I should do. I think you're just going to be a moderator. Oh, well, if I'm, if I'm there, though, they're going to, yeah. If, oh, okay. If, if uh, I'm, I maybe shouldn't be saying this because Jonathan's listening in here, but if Jonathan and Amelia are smart, they're going to avoid talking to each other like the plague and just pick on my worldview. You you know what you need to do. You just need to say you know trans rights go and and leave the room. <laughs> well, no, I, that doesn't bother me. Um, I'll still keep half my brain tied behind my back. <laughs> well, that, that, but then you're not delivering on the goods because we we want to see two uh, presuppositional apologists arguing against each other. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's true too. Like so, Jonathan, we do want to hear. Uh, your presuppositions, your starting point, and how they may be the same or different compare and contrast, contrast to Emilio's starting point. If you guys just pick on me, then we won't get there. So, um, And be, be, be specific. Like, let's talk about if the same-sex couples should adopt children, yes or no, you know? Because the other thing is, like, it could be the case that they will just completely avoid talking about the points of disagreement, and they will just agree about mere Christianity, you know? I don't think that's going to be the case, because no, I think won't. the other guy is pretty crazy. Uh, no, he's so more yeah. biblical. He's not, cra- right? he's not crazy, he's more biblical. <laughs> yeah, I think they will go back to the Bible, and unfortunately, if that happened, uh, yeah, the bigot wins every time. Uh, and I apologize that we've gotten off of Randall Rouser. So uh, I'm going to start the music, and I'm going to turn you down, Camille, so if you do talk, people will barely hear you. Two-minute warning. I think Pine Creek was too nice to Randall Rouser. Well, uh, the Randall Rouser interview was, the second one was probably the harshest I've ever been on a person because I basically called him irrational and an idiot. I didn't use the word idiot. But he holds himself to the public as a apologist, Christian. He blogs, he preaches once in a while. I'm not hard on people who like are Christians on the street. But I forced him to, um, he wanted to get deep philosophically. I gave him 30 second answers and forced him to ask follow up questions, and he just made assumptions instead of doing that. But I laid into him here, Floyd, if you came late, uh, both Camille and I. Randall Rouser is in this video saying the same things as Gary Habermas, Frank Turek. J. Warner Wallace. Randall Rouser is a conservative fundamentalist Christian wrapping himself into the garments of a progressive Christian. Maybe that's the wrong word. More liberal leaning, more accepting, whatever you want to call it. I wanted to get into... um, this guy, Gary Habermas, but we ran out of time. (laughs) Poof! a pretty good description, Doug. Thanks, Joe D. Joe D's been here forever. Poof. My sincere, deep, deep apologies to Randall Rouser. He messaged me during this live stream and he wanted to come on, but we ran out of time. Thanks for any donations I might have missed, and I'm sure I did. Take care. Maybe see you tomorrow or Friday.